uh, Miss Day Facebook page so you can pass it and share it with others. Uh, important history. And as you think about what happened, um, and God's timing is always impeccable because it was just before this, about 20 years, that Gutenberg had created the printing press. And wouldn't it just be like God to say, okay, I'm going to be able to have you mass distribute this message. Luther comes along and does exactly that, and we are the recipients of this man's heresy. Any heretics here today? Isn't that awesome? Be like, I am a heretic, and I'm proud of it because the message is this. God saves us not based on what we do. God saves us based upon his mercy and his grace that is found solely in the person work of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's our message today, and we were going to discover more of this in 1 John. So turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to finish out the chapter, and believe it or not, we've only got a few more weeks left in John, and I do uh, thank God for the way he is wonderfully disturbing our lives as his, as his people. And, and I, I say that because I am privy to conversations with you based upon what God is doing through his word. And it seems like over the past couple of weeks, this message of loving others as we have been loved in Christ is one we all have to wrestle with and grapple with. It is one where I am on the phone with you. I am meeting with you. We are discussing the implications of these truths. And when all of a sudden there's more than one or two or three, there's several of you that are really wrestling with this and wanting to honor God. I have to sit there and go, God's doing something. God is doing something. And I praise God for not just his word, but the work of his spirit to make us into more loving people. Amen. Because that is what we need to be. Is, is, is our followers of Christ who love other people unconditionally because that's how we've been loved. So this morning we're going to continue this, this theme as we look at 1 John chapter 4. Um, let me start by uh, mentioning something interesting that happened this week. So Albert Einstein, right? Totally a different class of human being that most of us operate with. You know, with. Um, we know Einstein by his theory of relativity. Does anyone want to stand up and explain Einstein's theory of relativity? That's what I thought. I didn't think there were going to be any takers. But one aspect of Einstein's theories remains largely unknown, and I bet you didn't know that he had a theory of happiness. Matter of fact, this past week, his theory of happiness was sold for $1.3 million dollars. His theory of happiness was written on a little piece of paper and given to a bellboy in 1922, just before Einstein receives his Nobel Prize in physics. So this week, it was auctioned off $1.3 million for Einstein's theory of happiness. Now you're going, what does the paper say? Because could Einstein hold the keys to everlasting happiness? Could he have discovered the thing that we've all been searching for? So here's what Einstein's note says. A calm and modest life brings more happiness than the pursuit of success combined with constant restlessness. $1.3 million. And I'm going... I've got a better message than that, right? Einstein writes this note down, gives it to a bellboy. It sells in 2017 for $1.3 million. And yet the message is lackluster. The message falls far short of what we truly wanted to say. Because we're sitting here as grown men and women, and we are wondering why we haven't found lasting happiness. We have bought into the lie that my job will make me happy. My wife will make me happy. The, the hobbies and the luxuries I surround my life with will bring me happiness. And yet, there's a constant restlessness. Because those things don't, they don't satisfy us. And so, I bring to you a message this morning better than Einstein's theory of happiness. I come bearing a message for you this morning that's not going to cost you $1.3 million. 
I'm coming to you to let you know that joy and happiness can be found, but it's not found in what you have done or are doing or plan to do. Lasting happiness is rooted in God and his love for us. The world strives, the world seeks, the world chases, and it's not what you have in material possessions. It's not what you think you have as far as a worldview. It's knowing that God loves each and every one of us unconditionally where we are as we are. And accepting that love brings everlasting joy, complete satisfaction, Now, many of you already believe this message, but there's still a striving inside. What I'm here to tell you is, it's not just a come to Jesus moment that's that's gonna change your life. It's a come to Jesus moment and living in the truths that Jesus promises that will change your life. And it it involves two words, and this is what we're gonna unpack this morning. It involves gladness, And it involves gratitude. Matter of fact, those are the two main points of the message this morning. Okay? There's gospel gladness, and there's gospel gratitude. Gospel is critical to understanding gladness and gratitude. Gospel, i.e., what God has done for us freely in the personal work of His Son, Jesus, For us who are undeserving, that is the gospel. That is the good news. The key, though, for good news to be good news is that it goes from your mind to your heart and ultimately changes your life. See, John has been and will continue to emphasize the importance of belief that translates into behavior. Because there's a lot of believers in Christ who have not had their actions, their behaviors, their lives altered by the truth they they, they claim to believe. John is key in focusing on belief, and as belief grows, so will our loving actions toward God and one another. Matter of fact, he says this morning, if you claim to love God and hate your brother, You are a liar. Belief, true, saving belief, will translate itself into actions. Look at 1 John chapter 4. As faith grows, love will increase. God's love has been planted in our hearts because of Jesus, if you have accepted this. And now that love has has a fertile soil in which to grow from. And we look at these verses, let's look at verses 13 through 21, and we'll come back and we'll we'll just take this apart bit by bit so we can truly understand the, the thrust of John's message. By this we know, by this we know, we have certainty, we have confidence, that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And we who have received this Savior, right? We have confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in Him and He in God. Verse 16, And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because he as he is so also are we in this world there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love we love because he first loved us If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has not seen cannot love God, or no, who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Two main points I really want to emphasize this morning. Gospel gladness that exists in our hearts and gospel gratitude that exists in our actions. The heart is the oven in which these glorious truths are baking. And the smell and the heat that comes from what's going on inside here radiates itself, makes itself known in our actions. See, so what I want to first deal with is what's going on in here. Because if there's nothing going on in here, the kitchen smells rotten. If there's no baking of the gospel in the oven of your heart, there's no like, this smells like warm cookies. This smells like Thanksgiving. I mean, how many of us have memories walking into a home, whether it be mom or grandma or whatever, and you just know there's something awesome in the oven, right? See, gospel gladness, when it takes root in our hearts, meaning we've embraced it with our lives, will make itself known in something glorious, something awesome, something satisfactory, and people will notice. This is why there's a private aspect of our faith, and then there's a public aspect of our faith. Right? So, why be glad? Because look what John just told us in these verses. You have been loved of God. Do you deserve this love? No. But he does it for us. He loves us, and that's why we are able to love now. And when you walk with this kind of gladness, it really brings about two things in our hearts. It brings about a heart that's secure, and it brings about a heart that's confident. And can I tell you, this is one of my favorite messages to share with people because the more I press in in my relationship with Jesus and allow that oven to bake the goodies that God has given me spiritually to put there in my heart, I grow more secure and more confident. Less appealing are the things of the world and more attractive is the the love of God in Christ. Less appealing is trying to please everybody and be liked by everybody and more satisfactory, that satisfaction is found in just me loving Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. If it is your goal to impress people, you will come up short. If it's your goal to be liked by everybody, you're going to come up empty. If it's your goal to try to appease everybody, you're going to kind of come up ending up appeasing nobody. What takes place in our hearts because you have been created by God is you have an innate relationship, an intimate relationship with your creator. That is what brings lasting satisfaction. And like St. Augustine said 1,700 years ago, my heart is restless until it finds its rest with you. That's it. So my encouragement to you at the first part of this message is for you to see what John spells out for us, that truth that ought to fill us and bring about gospel gladness. Look at the first few verses verses 13 through 16 because here we have this picture of the trinity and what god has done for us through the spirit the son the father one god made himself known in three persons notice in verse 13 what he says by this we know that we abide in him that in he in us because he has given us his spirit let me just explain something very very basic but something that's important for all of us to know Upon receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, upon receiving the free forgiveness of sins, looking upon the cross that Jesus didn't need to be on, but he did it for us. That was the cross I needed to be on, but he took and paid the price for me, and now I've embraced that by faith. There's a transaction that takes place, not only of the forgiveness of my sins, And not only being given Christ's righteousness, so now when I stand before God in Christ, I stand perfect and blameless, even though sometimes I don't feel like it. There's another gift 
that's given to you at the moment of conversion, and that is the Holy Spirit of God is deposited in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. God gives you all of himself to show you you are not alone. He gives you all of himself to show you the life he wants you to live is not dependent on your power, it's dependent upon his resources. He deposits the Holy Spirit within you and now there is this internal mechanism, spiritually speaking, that now confirms that we are his kids because his spirit bears witness with our spirit as we walk in obedience, as we walk in holiness, as we walk in loving actions that bring glory to God. This is what verse 13 says. You know, you have assurance. If your heart cries out, God, I want to love you. Boy, that's, that's exactly the fire that's burning and, and glorifies God. See, the Spirit is a wonderful gift. Now, I'm going to tell you the difference between being given the Spirit and, and, and having the Spirit dwell or versus having this filling of the Spirit. Write those two words down. Dwelling of the Spirit, filling of the Spirit. First, every Christian is dwelt by the Spirit 100%. There are some theologies, there are some churches, there are some denominations that teach that you're only partly baptized. You've got to wait for some future second baptizing of the Holy Spirit. You in Christ have been given 100% of the Holy Spirit. You lack nothing. Yay, that's good truth. But the key is the second part, the filling of the Spirit. Because not everyone experiences the filling of the Spirit. So my favorite illustration, and I totally forgot to grab milk and Hershey syrup for this illustration, so just visualize it with me if you would. Who doesn't like chocolate milk, right? Who does not like chocolate milk? Don't raise your hand. This is not confession time. Just, just go with it. I'm up here. I have a glass of milk. I pour a bunch of Hershey syrup in it. I mix it all up, right? And then I let sit. Now, all of us who are experienced chocolate milk makers know if you let that thing sit five minutes, ten minutes, something happens to the chocolate. What happens? It settles. You know, you make the chocolate milk, you get a phone call, you're on the phone, ten minutes later you come back, and it's like all that chocolate is at the bottom. Now, the question is, has any of the chocolate escaped the cup? Is all of the chocolate you put in still there? What's the problem? It's been inactive. It's been sedentary. It has just found its way to the bottom because there's been nothing to engage it to permeate the entire milk. So what happens? You get a spoon and you mix it up, and all of a sudden through your activity, now all of the milk is permeated by the chocolate. Now I know after service, everyone's going to beeline it to the bar to get chocolate milk, and that's not my M.O. today, all right? Scott, chocolate milk was, sales was off the charts this past Sunday. What happened, right? But you get the illustration. See, if we don't activate the spirit within us, then we're not truly spirit-filled. It's all there. You haven't lost any of it. The problem is, through our walk of obedience, through our walk of pursuing holiness, through our walk of just desiring to do what God wants us to do, it's only then is the spirit actively permeating every faculty of our being amen crude illustration but it makes a point that we are called to not just say we know christ but to live in that truth you've been given the holy spirit of god to dwell in you thank you father for not leaving me alone thank you father for not leaving me powerless john 14 john 16 two great chapters you want to explore more of what the holy spirit does in our lives second truth regarding the son look at verses 14 and 15 here the son is presented and the father is the one who sends the son to be the savior of the world in verse 15 whoever confesses that jesus is the son of god god abides in him and he in god circle that word confess Because this means a wholehearted embracing of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. See, a confession is something you earnestly believe. See, God wants us to know that it is not mere intellectual assent that gets you saved. It is embracing Christ as the Savior. It's embracing Christ as Lord. It is a wholehearted acknowledgement that He has done what I 
deserve, and through him I can be freed and forgiven of my sins. So now the spirit who dwells in you because of what the Savior has done, something that we can never do for ourselves, is indicative of the Father's love for us because the Father is the one who sent the Son. The Father sends the Son, the Son accomplishes salvation, and now the Spirit applies salvation and activates that salvation in us. There's the Trinity. You're welcome. Wonderful truth, right? But if we forget these things, if we push them to the back burner, there is no gladness that cooks within. To daily wake up and acknowledge the fact of what God has done for us. The gift of the Spirit, the sacrifice of the Son, and the Father who loves us, and He loves us so much, He is the initiator of love. That produces a gladness inside. And the person that doesn't walk in this gladness doesn't have that security. Nothing in this world will bring you the security more than your constant reflection upon the Trinitarian love of God for you. So I was doing college ministry a long time ago, and we did a retreat out to San Diego. And these, these were fun days. And is there anyone from those co- the college ministry back 20 years ago here? This one? We have a few people that are part of the Missio Day that were, have been with us for that long. I know. They, they, they deserve to be saints at this point for hanging out with us that long. So Lori and I had a band. We would just do this kicking music. We were ministering to goths and jocks and nerds and all these types of people. And so we went out to California, and we were at this Christian college doing this weekend retreat. And uh, all of a sudden, it started coming to our attention that uh, we were getting fined by the Christian college over stupid little things that were being done around campus. Like someone came to us and said, yeah, here's a citation for 50 bucks because one of your college students was smoking. And I'm going, what? And they're like, yeah, here's another fine for $100 dollars. Uh, because your music was too loud in the in the auditorium and all of a sudden the joy of the weekend just kind of got sucked out of me right because i'm sitting there going okay we're a, a christian college group at a christian college doing a summer retreat why are people acting like this and all of a sudden i discovered something interesting the theology of the college taught that you could lose your salvation And all of a sudden I made a connection, and I'm not going to die on this hill, but I go, if you're constantly fearing your loss uh, loss of salvation, you become a little bit more legalistic in your attitude. You know, if all of a sudden everything now regarding eternally significant stuff falls on your shoulders, you're, you're quick to point out faults in others. You're quick to be legalistic. And my thinking was, well, no wonder they're giving us all these citations, Because they're fearing deep down inside they're going to lose their salvation. Now, that was just my connection. (laughs) But I make that point because the more legalistic somebody is, is the less gospel gladness is radiating in their hearts. The more you have to walk around and point fingers and point out faults and say, yeah, you're an idiot and you're a jackass or whatever, is the moment you sit there and there's not gospel gladness raging in your heart. You know what? You are not responsible for someone else's attitude and behavior. You are not responsible for somebody else's salvation. You are responsible for your own heart. And I'm going to tell you right now, you better be stoking the fire in your own heart. Because evidence of you stoking the fire in your own heart is you're going to be a loving, gracious person. Yes, we point people to Jesus. Yes, we hold one another accountable, but we do it out of a sense of love rather than I'm God's earthly representation of the Holy Spirit. Amen? There is security in knowing that my salvation does not depend upon me. It is entirely in God's hands. I'm going to fuel my heart with those truths, and I'm going to continue to grow ever more secure. So here's the answer to insecurity. Focus on the cross of Christ. Here's the answer to insecurity. Look at the Trinitarian love of God. Here's the answer to eternal security and and battling insecurity within. Know that, yeah, you didn't deserve salvation, but you got it anyways through Jesus, and you ought to live in that truth. Amen? Second point is this. As we think about the future, John shifts gears. Look at verse 17. By this love is perfected with us that we may have confidence. Circle that word confidence because you want not just a secure heart, but a confident heart, especially as you consider future days. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. The idea here is that as you consider God's love for you, you are growing into a more loving person towards God and others. It's not either or, it's both and. And as you think about future judgment, here's the reality. We will all stand before one day before God and be judged. Now, the judgment for those who don't believe in Jesus is going to be a horrible judgment. Because it is appointed for man to die once, according to Hebrews 9, and then the judgment. There is a separating of the goats from the sheep. There's a separating from the wheat and the tares that will come. And the only thing that's going to get somebody into heaven is Jesus. So for judgment for those who don't embrace Jesus is eternity apart from God in a place we call hell. But just because you may know Jesus and you think you got the fast track to heaven, you need to stop. Because John presents something interesting because there is a future judgment for those of us that are in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Acts 17, write those few verses down. You will stand before God and be evaluated based on your faithfulness here on earth. So hear what I'm saying. There's a future accounting. There's a future evaluation happening even for those in Christ that does not involve loss of eternal security and being with God in heaven forever, but it has to do with earthly stewardship. So track with me on this. God is not going to ask you, you know, did you, did you believe in my son? He's going to know whether you believed in his son. He's going to know whether you were saved through Christ. His question is, what did you do with the time, talent, and treasures I gave to you? Did you spend them on yourselves or did you spend it for the glory of God? Did you spend it for your own happiness or did you use the time, treasures, and talents for other people's betterment? This is going to happen to every single one of us. I was just talking to someone this past week about future judgment and the accounting. And uh, he was talking about some YouTube videos out there. I mean, what's not on YouTube, right, these days? But uh, no, I don't have another YouTube video to show you guys this morning. But there's a future accounting that's going to happen with every one of us. But the reality of what John's saying is that you grow more confident, even in light of what's coming in the future, that you're not afraid (laughs) because Perfect love cast out fear. So if I am connected with God, His Spirit's abiding in me, I am going to be a loving person. And the more loving person I am by means of His love and grace flowing through me, the more I am growing in confidence and the less I'm growing in fear. The more I am going, yes, Jesus, come, and not, no, Jesus, don't come. I mean, how many of you are fearing that day? You shouldn't, because we are talking about your entrance into your eternal home that your father is preparing for you through his son, and you need to know that there's a confidence that comes to his good and great work in you and through you. So John wants us to understand that you can be confident the more you abide in him and understand his love for you, you will become a loving person. And that loving person, though not perfect in its execution, will bring a confidence to your heart. Gospel gladness. It's a good point, isn't it? That we are not here to focus on external behaviors primarily. We are here to focus on your heart. And just as a reminder, as we jump into the second point, let me remind you how you have been blessed by God. So what I did is I just went through a few verses. Don't even write these down. Some of you got your pen and paper ready. This is going to go too fast, but just soak in these truths that are found in the scripture. Through Christ, you know you're dead to sin. Through Christ, you are spiritually alive. Through Christ, you are forgiven. Through Christ, you are declared righteous. Through Christ, you are a child of God. Through Christ, you are God's possession. Through Christ, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Through Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. Through Christ, you are free from the law. Through Christ, you are crucified with him. Through Christ, you're an heir of God. 
Through Christ, you are free from the desires of the flesh. Through Christ, you are declared blameless and innocent. Through Christ, you are a light in this world. Through Christ, you are victorious over Satan. Through Christ, you are cleansed from sin. Through Christ, you are set free from the power of sin. Through Christ, you are secure in him. Through Christ, you are at peace with God. Through Christ, you are loved by God. And that is merely scratching the surface. Because we'd go into tomorrow if we just went through the list. But if you think and contemplate and meditate on those truths alone, ladies and gentlemen, you are more than blessed. Let the gospel gladness of these truths, 1 John, sink in and allow that oven to never grow cold. So what is the evidence of the oven burning red hot? What is the evidence of this thing we call the heart and this gospel gladness is cooking and sending off this amazing smell and giving off this great heat? It's gospel gratitude that comes through our actions. See, faith without works, according to James, is dead. And we are not saved by our works, but a genuine sign of our salvation is that our faith works. Matter of fact, that was one of Martin Luther's famous quotes some 500 years ago. Even though we are saved by faith alone, we are not saved by a faith that is alone. Look at verse 19, 20, and 21. So we love because he first loved us. Circle that verse and never forget that. We have a God who is a God who initiates every time. We have a God who takes the lead. And why is it important for God to initiate? Because you and I would never initiate a relationship with Him. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, and only in Christ does He make us alive in Christ. We don't want God. We don't care from God. We don't like God. We hate God. I mean, there's no other better picture to paint of it. But yet, He loves us which now serves as a model of our love for people who may not want it, who may not like us, who may hate us, we are still called to initiate. Because why? This is called response love. First note, blank in your notes there, response love. We respond as we walk and reflect on the love God has for us, that He acts, He initiates, He shows compassion, He gives mercy. And now, as we respond to that, we can't help but now share it with others. And again, it may fall on deaf ears, it may fall on dead hearts, but what and how the person responds is not up to you. You are accountable for loving unconditionally. You are a call to account to love with no strings attached. Matter of fact, write that phrase down. That's one of my favorite phrases. No strings attached. So back to my days of college ministry, right? We're down at ASU, first week of classes. You know, it's just a, it's just students clamoring all over the place, right? And we went down as a college ministry just to love these students. And so we thought it'd be great. You know, here it is, August, Arizona, a, you know, ASU. We're there on campus and we're giving out free ice cream. I mean, who doesn't want free ice cream? you'd be amazed who didn't want free ice cream because the moment they saw the free ice cream connected with some sort of christian ministry is the moment they just walked by and said no thank you and you want to know why because there were students on campus that were tired of being loved with strings attached if i take your gift what now do i owe you right if i accept this do i have to give you my phone number if I accept this, do I have to come to your, your service? And it was hard to communicate a love with no strings attached. And I'm going to tell you, the only way you can fight through loving people and let them know that you sincerely want to bless them with no strings attached is that it's got to happen over the long haul. You have to build relationships with people over the long haul. And I'm going to tell you that as someone who owns a coffee shop, who connects with customers, and after two years, three years of having inroads with customers and to let them know that I love them for who they are, not by what, what I can get from them, is the moment they start opening up about their lives. And the moment they're inviting me over to their house for their kid's birthday party. And the moment we're going mountain biking together. I mean, here is 
a couple years ago, I was just serving this person who was nameless, a latte. And now we're hanging out together. And I'm going to tell you, there's something to be said about loving people with no strings attached. Your goal is not to get them to church. Your job is to love them with the love of Jesus and hope that God does some work on their hearts to change them. Evangelism is not getting people to church. Evangelism is not getting people plugged into a program that your church offers. Your job in evangelism is living out through word and deed the love, the grace, the compassion and kindness of Jesus Christ. Because you better believe if God puts someone on your heart to love with that kind of love, you need to know it with confidence. Perhaps he's working on the other end as well. Don't force it. Don't manipulate it. Don't make it something contrived. Let it be spirit-led. And just be ready to go to love and to share. Because remember last week, the greatest gospel anyone can read is not the gospel of Matthew, Luke, John, or whatever. The greatest gospel anyone's going to read is the gospel of you. So what's the gospel of Scott look like this week? Pretty horrible. How about the gospel of Ron? Not much better. Gospel of Gunther? Skip it. You know what I'm saying? No. No. I kid because I love, bro. I kid because I love. So there's response love, but then the second part of this is, is honest love. See, the more you walk in the, in the security and the confidence that God knows everything about you and still loves you, that God could really hold something up against you that he chooses not to because of the free forgiveness in Christ, you can walk in honesty. There is no pretending. We don't want to be hypocritical. We don't want to be fake. We want to be the real deal. And can I tell you, like I said, you know, doing ministry for as long as I have, God has grown me in this area because I thought I had to give you the best picture of who I was. And I wasn't going to tell you all about the dark secrets and the struggles and this and that. Not that there's a lot, right? My wife will come to me like at lunch and go, what were those dark secrets you were alluding to in the message, right? Like, but I'm not, I mean, I yell at my kids out of anger. I fight with my wife. I see things on the internet maybe I shouldn't see. I binge watch Stranger Things too. No, not really. <laughs> Even though that is on the agenda. But uh, we, we're all living life together. And, and, and if you've heard me say this a thousand times, you're going to hear it a thousand more, is that it is okay to be who you are. But it's even better to become who God wants you to be. And honest love Knowing that you can put a facade on and fake everybody out here. But the one who knows about you that you can't fake out is to, is to live before him exposed and transparent and vulnerable. And you know, it's okay. He invites you to come out of secrecy. And he invites you to come out of the pretendness you've been living in. The upside down, you know. Don't, you don't need to live there. Come on, man. Be loved by God. And when you're able to be loved by God, look at what happens. says, I love God, but you hate your brother. See, he's a liar. You're pretending. What you're showing is that you really don't know. So in indication number one, that true life, eternal life, Jesus life exists in you, is that you are a, a, an incredibly loving person. Though not perfect, you are though growing in this. So you say you love God, but you hate your brother, you're a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen does not, cannot love God whom he has not seen. His logic is impeccable right here. Think of what John's saying. He's arguing from a lesser to a greater analogy. If you can't love that which is right before you, that you can touch and feel and hear and smell and see there's certainly no way you can love god whom you don't see i mean this is easier to harder right it is harder to walk by faith we'd rather have something physical and tangible right there but john is saying if you do not manage to love his creatures then you cannot love the creator if you cannot have the capacity to love his children then you can't love their father john stott says it this way 
it is obviously easier to love and serve a visible man than an invisible God. And if we fail in the easier task, it's absurd to claim success in the harder. So two things to close this out. It, it's a matter of, number one, opportunity, and it's a matter of, number two, obedience. God, every single day, provides us opportunity to show Jesus' love to people. Every day. There's your homework. Right? Allow that gospel gladness to burn in the oven of your heart and then be a gracious, thankful person. That gospel gratitude is going to radiate. People are going to ask you, what, what is it that makes you happy? The world's falling apart and you seem optimistic. Everyone seems so down and you seem so hopeful. What is it? It's gospel gratitude. And that gratitude is going to make itself known in your loving, Christ-centered, God-glorifying actions. And so there's a matter of recognizing, number one, those opportunities. Who does God want you to love with no strings attached? Who is it today that God's saying, you know you're going to lunch with them? You know you're going to go watch the game tonight. Who is it going to be that you're going to go love with no strings attached? Who is it tomorrow that you're going to walk into work and see that usually causes a rise of in you? And now God's saying, hold that at bay and show Christ kindness. Who's the neighbor? Who's the... I was going to say aunt and uncle, but I'll use another uh, illustration. Cousin? Nephew? Sister? In-law? Oh, in-law? In-law? <laughs> Who is it? So there's opportunities. And God holds you accountable to seize those opportunities. And in those opportunities, then it's a second matter of obedience. This is not about you. This is about the God you claim to love and know and serve. Because verse 21 says, And this commandment we have from Him. What is a command? It is something that is imperative. This is not optional. This is not college electives. Like, good, I don't have to take it. No, you do. And if you continue to refuse, then you are purely telling us that you really don't know God. This is an exercise in futility. You worship Him with your lips, but you don't love Him with your hearts. And that's the last thing we want. Pretend Christians. Because the one that loves God should love his brother also. Love with no strings attached. Amen? Good? Good message? It's a hard message, man. There's so many times I'm like, uh, can we just stop the series now and skip to something else? Let's talk about the Ten Commandments, right? <laughs> Whatever. But this is good. We need this. Because the world is waiting, not for the next articulate Christian debate. The world is eagerly waiting the next great Christian lover. The one who extends compassion and kindness that is not like anything else in this world. And we can do it together. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. God, um, you know how this message is so, so tough. To, to wrap our hearts and minds around. It's easy to do the rah-rah time before you and say, yeah, thanks for saving me, God, but it's so, so much more difficult to love people that are just hard to love. And yet my prayer for myself and my, my family here today is this, that we would understand that we were those unlovely people that you chose to love. And knowing everything about us that you do, you still show us incredible grace and mercy and kindness. 
And thank you for doing that in Jesus. May that penetrate our hearts and may that turn our worlds upside down so that we can go forth and tell people with all thankfulness (laughs) that there's someone who knows everything about us and loves us. Like that woman at the well who had been living in such guilt and shame and condemnation that you invite us to come into the light of your love and acceptance and let others know about it. Father, you're, you're awesome. Thank you for this message today, for your word that speaks to our hearts, for your spirit that enables us to live the lives you've called us to live. To you be the glory forever and ever. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon, all right? Have a great day. Any ladies that want